it has been called the most massive and ambitious airlift operation in human history. During the Gulf War in 1991, a sky-darkening fleet of gigantic cargo aircraft of the 437th Military Airlift Wing soared above the scorching Kuwait desert, carrying 144,661 tons of cargo and 93,126 passengers in 8,536 airlift missions. The overwhelming event was possible thanks to the might and superb engineering packed into one of the most iconic airborne workhorses of the U.S. Air Force, the Lockheed C-141 Starlifter. As the first strategic jet-powered airlifter in the world, the C-141 marked a turning point in the history of airlifter design, as no other cargo plane could match its reliability, practicality, and potency. And since then, no airlifters have been devoid of influence from the Starlifter's design. The aircraft became such a vital part of U.S. military operations that it was pushed beyond the limits of its capabilities in numerous missions, surpassing its rated service life and significantly increasing the chances of unforeseen catastrophes. The cargo plane issue. By the early 1960s, the U.S. military had a cargo plane problem. While fighters and even commercial planes were now fitted with jet-powered engines, most of its primary aircraft were still piston or turboprop engined. Piston engines were rapidly becoming obsolete, and even while turboprop was not by any means outdated, the configuration didn't allow for the remarkable speeds and maximum altitudes that jet propulsion could achieve. In a world where more and more warplanes were swiftly switching to jet power, the U.S. military could not risk being outclassed by other nations and putting American lives at risk, and obtaining a jet-powered cargo plane became a priority. The quickest solution was to adapt an existing passenger jet and transform it into an airlifter. Thus, the U.S. Air Force, with the support of Boeing, changed a Boeing 367-80 airliner prototype into the Boeing C-135 Stratolifter. Initially, 48 Boeing C-135s were ordered, and the model turned out to be a steady and adequate cargo plane. It was an efficient and spacious vehicle, while also providing much higher speeds and altitudes than propeller cargo planes. Despite its features and positive reception, the Boeing C-135 was still just a makeshift solution, as the prototype was not specifically designed for the high demands of a military operation, which meant that it didn't have what it took to become the United States' next airborne workhorse. Its fuselage was the critical flaw. As the C-135 was designed as a passenger aircraft, the fuselage sat above the wings. Consequently, a unique hydraulic elevator had to be used to lift the cargo all the way to the plane's loading gate. Using elevators was acceptable for crates and other smaller cargo, but loading massive vehicles became impossible. In addition, like many other passenger planes, the tail was tapered off, which meant the loading gate was fitted on the side of the aircraft, complicating loading operations even further. The side-loading gate also meant that the plane could not be used for paratrooper deployment, limiting the potential uses of the stratolifter even more. This wide array of difficulties resulted in the U.S. Air Force deciding to promote an ambitious project to create a brand new jet power airlifter with all the characteristics they desperately needed. Design In the spring of 1960, the U.S. Air Force issued Specific Operational Requirement 182, calling for the design of a new airlifter with particular characteristics. It had to perform a mission in a radius of at least 3,500 nautical miles while efficiently carrying 60,000 pounds of cargo. Also, its fuselage had to be as low as possible to facilitate loading operations, and it had to have a rear loading gate with ramps to drive vehicles in. The USAF also requested side doors for paratrooper operations and tactical missions. Considering all the possible applications the new cargo plane needed to have, the U.S. military also requested that the proposed airlifter meet not only all military aircraft guidelines, but also every civilian cargo plane regulation. Many aircraft manufacturers responded to the call, including Boeing, Lockheed, and General Dynamics, each of them reworking previous airlifter designs and adapting them to the requirements from the USAF. Lockheed's design was internally codenamed the Lockheed Model 300, and it would be the first large jet designed from the start to carry freight. Its main structural features compared to the C-135 would be the position of the wings and engines, which needed to be placed on top of the plane instead of below to get the fuselage and the cargo hold low enough for easy access. The other big difference involved an alternative tail design that allowed a rear cargo door and a sizable unobstructed cargo hold. The proposal resulted in a cargo plane with a T-tail and high-mounted swept wing, mounted with a total of four TF-33 turbofan engines. 
The cargo deck was lengthy and unhindered, and was designed to comfortably accommodate up to 154 troops, or 94,510 pounds of cargo. Performance-wise, the new airlifter was faster, more prominent, and capable of climbing higher than any previous propeller cargo plane. As such, Lockheed had delivered a sound design. Lockheed's submission was selected as the winner in March of 1961. In a historic moment, John F. Kennedy's first official act as president was to order the development of the Lockheed 300. A total of five units were ordered at first to be tested and evaluated, and the aircraft was named C-141 Starlifter. Then, on December 17, 1961, the Starlifter took to the skies for the very first time in an event that coincided with the 60th anniversary of the Wright brothers' first flight. A long and fruitful career. Testing trials were not over when the Starlifter was forced to make an anticipated combat debut, as the United States' unpredictable involvement in Vietnam called for the urgent assistance of airlifters. Thus, the first C-141s were sent to the front line. The aircraft's speed and reliability soon became a prevalent asset in the Vietnamese theater, and the novel cargo plane conducted thousands of sorties, delivering essential supplies and reinforcements to the battlefront. Still, the Starlifter could not completely replace its predecessor, the C-124 Globemaster II, due to its inability to transport outsized cargo in theater. But it didn't take long for it to become the backbone of the U.S. Air Force strategic airlift units during the late 1960s. In 1973, both the C-141 and the larger C-5 Galaxy delivered supplies from the U.S. to Israel during the Yom Kippur War as part of what came to be known as Operation Nickelgrass. Several C-141s flew 422 missions and transported a total of 10,754 tons of freight. The U.S. military depended so much on the Starlifter that by 1975, the fleet had amassed an average of 20,000 flight hours each, 75% of their rated lifespan. By then, the U.S. Air Force's most dependable aircraft were reaching the end of their life. Still, global conflicts would not wait for the development of new airlifters, so when Operation Desert Shield was greenlighted, C-141s from the 437th Military Airlift Wing carried most of the burden of supplying the operation. The Starlifter quickly became vital for Operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm, flying over 8,500 cargo missions. Still, the colossal task pushed the aging aircraft beyond its designed limits, and all scheduled maintenance activities were abruptly postponed to meet the extreme demands. Flying the ill-maintained and overworked Starlifter was becoming increasingly dangerous, and many military experts began to warn of possible catastrophic incidents if the units were not retired or significantly repaired. Above the Limit By 1992, the C-141 fleet had, on average, surpassed its 30,000 flight hour service life. In response, the U.S. Air Force initiated the process of putting the fleet through a life extension program, but numerous aircraft became defective in the meanwhile, and others had to be withdrawn entirely from active service. The units that continued to serve were strictly limited as to how much they could spend in the air. At the same time, the Government Accountability Office warned that in the event of another conflict on the scale of Desert Storm, the USAF would experience a significant shortage in airlift capacity due to the high fatigue conditions of the fleet. The Starlifter fleet was depleted. It had given all it was designed to provide, and then some, and now it was time to find a new cargo plane to become the backbone of American cargo operations. The decline of C-141 activity was gradual, as newer airlifters were incorporated into service. And on September 16, 2004, the C-141 left service with all active USAF units to be confined to Air Force Reserve and Air National Guard units for the final two years of its operational service life. The groundbreaking C-141, which had been a crucial watershed in strategic cargo aviation, was finally retired. Nevertheless, some units remained active for specific tasks. Some worked for NASA while housing the Kuiper Airborne Observatory's telescope, and others served as medical extraction units. The last active Starlifter landed for the last time on May 6, 2006. The iconic configuration of the C-141, with high-mounted swept wings, T-tail, and fuselage-attached main undercarriage, would become the norm for practically every future-sizable military transport and newer and more powerful airlifters like the Lockheed C-5, the McDonnell Douglas Boeing C-17, the Ilyushin IL-76, the Kawasaki C-1 and C-2, the Embraer KC-390, the Xi'an Y-20, and the Airbus A400M would all adopt the C-141's basic design. Thank you for watching our video. If you enjoyed it, please make sure to subscribe to this and all our other Dark Documentaries channels. 
and hit the bell icon so you won't miss any of our exciting history-inspired stories. Stay tuned for more.